Uh, Nathan Harvey, you in the room? So this was really, um, you know, the, the one of the tricks, right? Like, if you want to get selected, but like, you know, if you're kind of getting and you actually want to present at a conference, put a really cool name for your title. Like that, like freaks these guys out. Like, oh, I gotta read this now, right? So, so I'm trying to go to ChefCon. I've been to ChefCon in like four years. Uh, I started there, and um, and I want to go back, and only because they do this cool thing where Adam Jacob gets a band. And last year they dressed up as Kiss, they did the Ramones, so, like, I want in, I play guitar, I'm like, I want in, so I was going to, like, really tease Nathan here, that, like, this is our proposal for show. So, um, one other thing before I get started, I cracked the tooth over the holidays, so, look, um, so, you know, um, I can't do this now, but my kids hated this when we were in public, all I want for Christmas is my two friends. <laughs> so, there we go. All right, DevOps, what a long train. I put in some markers just to put a perspective of kind of technology. So along the way, I'm going to kind of say this was here, this was here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Except that I think uh, for those people who are new to this and you're looking at Chef Puppet or Ansible, it's important to know that uh, Mark Burgess in 1993 really invented the whole genre of infrastructure code, conversions, um, all that stuff. Um, and, um, and actually, Luke Canise, uh, the founder of Puppet Labs, was actually an active, uh, very active uh, CF Engine user and just got frustrated by the user interface and rewrote the whole thing, but, but maintained all those principles of convergence, uh, desired state, um, all those things, right? Uh, AWS, just as a mark of 2006. Uh, for me, um, you know, and, and this is through my lens, um, sorry, I'm the presenter, I get to use my lens, um, the, of what this thing has looked like, and it's kind of past, present, future, um, the, I was doing a bunch of Timely work for about 10 years, large enterprise infrastructure uh, stuff. Um, sold my company, had a non-compete, uh, so I looked at open source solutions, I was looking at Nagios, things like that. Like what were the things that went along with the uh, proprietary IBM stuff. And a friend of mine uh, said, you need to go to OSCON in Portland. And like, I was so, I, you know, I mean, the first hour in a fight with Tim O'Reilly about something, uh, the second hour in a fight with Mark Shuttleworth, like, that's what I do, right? So, um, anyway, um, but, it, like, I had no idea. Like, I really don't know what's going on. And, um, but um, somebody says to me, hey, you need to go see this presentation called Puppet. I'm like, that's a silly name. Um, and then, he, uh, what does it do? He said, monitoring. I'm like, all right, let's go. Like, had nothing to do with monitoring. Um, I'm in the back of the room, and now I'm going to use a little, I'm going to use literary license throughout this whole thing. So, you know, I, I just got through like 10 years working with J.P. Morgan Chase, doing infrastructure at the larger place. That was horrible in Pittsburgh. It was a terrible way to do this. Um, but I thought like I knew it all, right? Like, and I see this pimply-faced kid, and he really wasn't pimply-faced, but in the front of the room talking about this new tool of conversion manager. I'm like, what could this guy know? I've been, you know, at that point at least 25 years in the industry. Been the largest enterprise, and this is some kid that's been running around in colleges and implementing some technology. I would say less than 10 minutes, I'm in the front of the front row, and my life has changed. Right? Because I realized everything I had done was like false, wrong. Uh, <laughs> this was the right way to do this. Uh, I spent the next couple of years begging. Mind you, I, I'm not, I guess I am bragging. I'd say I don't brag, but I am bragging, but I'm not bragging. Uh, <laughs> I haven't had to beg for a job pretty much my whole career, except for about a two-year period where I literally grabbed on Luke's leg and said, please hire me, please hire me, and he wouldn't. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the thing was, uh, you know, I wrote a bunch of blog articles about, you know, like, infrastructure 2.0, this is, like, this is the way we need to do this. Um, this um, other guy pinged me, called Adam Jacobs, said, and by the way, he was a power puppet user doing incredible incredible infrastructure on bare metal with Puppet and um, said, oh, we want to hear a Puppet story. And I, I got to know Adam and we, we started learning a bunch of things and, and um, you know, and he was, you know, at that time he wasn't really starting Chef yet, but he was getting some really good ideas of what was going on. And he got to realize the cloud at this point is like now actually getting pretty ingrained in startups, right? It's, you know, starts to out six, but by this point, like any startup is, in fact, the VCs are telling you, um, you know, that you know that you can't you you know don't even come to us with a pitch that doesn't talk about cloud. Um, I'm not 
sure which came first, um, the Velocity 2009, Horizon Velocity, or Andrew, I mean, I guess I'm lazy, I could have looked it up, but I'm going to say it was uh, Andrew Schaefer. There, you know, I, I'm going to use this, it's probably totally inaccurate, but I'm, I'm going to call them archetypes of people that, that are just so important in this DevOps realm. And the only thing about me, my only value is I connect smart people. That's what I do. Like, um, I'm really not that smart. Um, but I can explain how, why you should listen to this really smart person. And Andrew is one of these people. Um, and so I listened to Andrew. He was in a podcast. Um, it had to be early 2009 with uh, Michael Cote and another guy named Israel Gass. It's called the Agile Executive. And I'm listening to it. And I knew Andrew already a little bit because he was an early founder of Puppet. And, um, and he starts talking about Agile infrastructure. An agile operation. And I had actually shadowed somebody in a little bit of agile work. A friend of mine was a, ran a development team at, uh, at BMC. And I started to learn just a little bit about agile. I'm like, oh my God. And I was driving my car and I almost ran off the side of the road. And I called up, uh, I called up Andrew. I'm like, what the hell is this? And he said, well, there's some dude in Belgium that's doing a bunch of stuff. So I spent a bunch of months trying to find this dude. And I'll talk about that dude in a little bit. But, um, but probably, um, you know, what's significant, uh, see, in this cool, you know, like this, um, the, um, is Velocity 2009. So um, most people, I don't know how many people, um, how many people are kind of familiar with the kind of, we, we call it kind of the landmark presentation in DevOps, John Oscars. Uh, okay, so not a lot of people, you should go back and watch it, Velocity 2009. And uh, the, um, where is it? You're in my presentation. Uh, the, uh, the, um, Basically, I was there, um, and he, he talked about how we did we do 10 deploys a day at Flickr to production. Now, again, literally licensed. Or I, I'm in the back room. I think there were people throwing up. You can't do this. You know, oh my God, you'll destroy the universe, <laughs> right? Like, this can't be, you know, and I'm going to tell you, like, we jumped, right? Like, 2,000, 1,000, billions, right? Um, it, it, it definitely is a landmark, and John is... Just like Andrew, again, one of these kind of, again, I'm going to use the word probably incorrectly, but I can't find a better word, but an archetype for our industry, right? And I'll tell you his arc, which is amazing um, through this history. Um, and somebody helped me on the timing. I normally use a presentation, like if I'm at 15, if I'm at a 15 or 20, that would be awesome. Good. Um, I have no idea where I am time wise. What was really interesting, too, is... You know, everybody in like the history of DevOps talks about John's presentation, and it was amazing. But there were two other phenomenal presentations that I met. And one, again, Andrew Schaefer, we talked about agile infrastructure. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded. Uh, the, the presentation is out there, and I get to links to all this stuff. And, uh, and he set the groundwork. I mean, John blew everybody's mind that there was a way that you can do something. And in fact, you know, one of the slides that's been used quite heavily is this kind of Spock, you know, Spock and Scotty, you know, the deaf and ops, right? The, you know, a little bit weird, um, she's close to the boss, thinks too hard, and the other guy just pulls the lever, get you out on the screen, and then out, right? That was his metaphor for operation, dev and ops. Um, but Andrew really laid it out, like as Andrew does, <laughs> very well. I'm a big fan of Andrew for so many reasons. But um, he just laid it out in a way that was, you know, not shock and awe, it was, it was just a very good, and I'll come back to something that was really important that came out of that presentation that almost everybody in the industry is taking credit for, that Andrew didn't get credit for. And then just kind of coincidentally, there was this other one with Adam Jacob and, um, and can people hear me because I'm walking away from the mic? Okay. Um, Adam Jacob and uh, Ezra, and I can never pronounce the last name, but the founder of Engine Yard. Um, and um, they're sitting there, and I knew Adam, and I knew a little bit what was going on with the chef thing. He was, he was kind of just was just getting it started. The first thing in the presentation, he says, I want you to run this command. It's going to curl something, something, <laughs> like chef.sh. And he's like, trust me, we won't kill your computer. And clearly he does this. And you got to realize, I mean, like, like you've all seen Kelsey Itow, or you see people now who do demos, like, like insane demos in their presentations. But, like, you didn't see that back then. You just didn't see this, like, um, no holds bar. And um, and he literally threw, oh, okay, sure, you know, like Mac, bang, you know, and, and, uh, and like literally walked you through like building web servers and infrastructure. It was mind blowing. Like it was, it was, you know, 
mean, the first time people used cloud, that was mind blowing. The fact that you were sitting there in a presentation and you would just, oh yeah, blah, 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 hit enter again, blah, 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 open up this file, look at it, blah, blah, blah. And you like had an Apache web server and all this stuff, and it was like, oh my God. Like, it was so simple, right? And, um, you know, Chef got started. You know, there's, um, the, you know, one of the, the real history points was the first DevOps days in Git. It was actually a DevOps day. Um, that was that, like, so for me, it was like that guy that Andrew said had to track down. I finally got all of him. His name was Patrick Labar. He was running this event. And, um, you know, there were some other side stories about him and Andrew at an earlier Agile. I'll skip that for now. But um, so it was uh, this thing that I, was, that I finally got a hold of. He said, yeah, well, we're running this event. At the time, I was at Canonical, and I was actually working with Simon Wardley. I was actually, we were doing something terrible, really just horribly terrible. We were taking Eucalyptus, this is pre-OpenStack, and Eucalyptus, which was at the time a terrible product. And we were calling it Ubuntu Enterprise Cloud, which was terrible. Uh, I mean, you pray to get the thing started, you know. You know, um, and um, sorry, it just was terrible. Um, <laughs> but I was a good evangelist, so I gave a presentation there, and I, it was called "I Ain't Pretty, But I Sure Can Dance." And um, but it was it was a, an interesting renaissance. There were forty, maybe fifty people. In my memory, it was forty. You look at the list; it says fifty. I, I don't know. Um, I think it was close to thirty-five or forty. But um, but it was, the, it was a group of people, and you gotta remember, I've been doing like a lot of years of this large scale, crusty enterprise stuff. You know, I'm starting here at Chef and all this stuff. But I used to just young people that were so energetic about a new way to do this thing. And, uh, and, and from there, you know, um, actually Lindsay Holman went to Sydney and started the Elf Movement there. Stephen Nelson Smith, Ari Paneer, uh, some other people I'm probably forgetting went to the UK. I was the lone wolf. I came back and um, decided uh, at the time I was actually working for Chef at this point. I was actually early in the Chef. And my boss was one of the, um, the organizers of Velocity. And we decided to run in Mountain View, in conjunction with, the, with Velocity, um, a dev stage in the US. And a um, couple of interesting points, right? So, how many of you have been to Velocity? Right? It's about three days of like pounding technical stuff. And one of the things we were really worried about was, like, if you do three days of velocity and then you do two days of deadlock, are you going to be totally burned out from just too much? And, like, so we debated, should we do it before or not? We decided to do it after. And I remember, like, at 3 o'clock on the end of the event, there were still 275 people in the room, and they were just as passionate as they were at the first day of velocity. Like, I knew something was freaking happening. And again, to put it in perspective, this was 300 people, not 40 people, less than six months later. And um, Damon Edwards and I, we do a DevOps Cafe podcast. I don't listen to it because we're so lazy. You're just going to yell at me next time you see me because you're going to say, hey, when's the next time you're going to do it? And I'm going to apologize. So, um, But anyway, um, we're really bad at, at turning this into any type of normal business, but we've been doing it for eight, about eight years. We decided to just talk about that event. It was such a mind, I mean, the DevOps Day get was interesting. I mean, it was, yeah, I'm going to use a, a, like a religious metaphor, you know, the, and, and I don't want to offend anybody, but like, it was like Christianity was created in Ghent, but um, Constantine and the Holy <laughs> Roman Empire like happened in, in, in Mountain View. And I, I can't tell you, like, that was real, because there it just blew. It blew up, you had velocity, you had people there. And we actually came up with this uh, accidental acronym in trying to describe ourselves what happened, called CAMS, Culture Automation Measurement Sharing. Um, over the years, it's been modified by just humbled me. CAMS or CAMS, whatever you want. Um, uh, you know, actually in 2015, I did a state of DevOps, and I, I, I'll, I'll talk about complexity a little bit later. But, um, but the, um, I, I really rethought about what CAMS really meant, uh, which was really kind of a feedback loop, or you know, if you want to get real technical, cybernetic feedback loop, that it really is about continuation or continuous, you know, consultation is continuous improvement. Um, automation is, you know, the A is uh, kind of continuous delivery or continuous integration. Um, measure is really a form of learning, continuous learning, and the sharing is the, the virtual cycle that you share internally. And in fact, you know, like, I'll have some data about DevOps days. Externally is really, the, the beauty of 
about DevOps is we've really blended the internal and external, right? Like, um, you know, back in my day, like, you people just wouldn't share in your organization. If you were a bank, you didn't show up and say, let me tell you how we're doing things. In fact, in the early days, Google wouldn't tell you anything. Facebook started showing up really early and like, hey, we run this, we're running that, and here's a cool open source tool. Like, the thing that was awesome about DevOps is, like, it was part of a precondition to Common Core. I mean, it wasn't a rule, but if you were going to work for, like, Barclays or a bank, you were going to come up and, like, people say, hey, what did you do for that? We really can't tell you what we use for our marketing tools. You know, like, you know, I mean, it happens periodically, but, and then you see all the stickers on the back, and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I know that. <laughs> this was an icon. I always said uh, why Andrew Schaefer is so important. Um, the um, you, you know he, he kind of started this. And this you started seeing this all over the place, and I was even guilty. I had forgotten that I was in his presentation, and he's the one that created it. Um, I actually attributed it at one point to um, another person who wrote a book, but he had this idea of the wall of confusion, right? Which was the greatest metaphor. For DevOps. You know, Dev and Ops, and, and Dev throws it over the wall, and Ops like, God, here it comes again. And then, like, you guys screwed up. No, it was y'all. You know, I mean, back and forth, right? And, and, like, what we started thinking about, like, is how do we crush that wall? What is that wall in our organization? You know, it's behavior, it's culture. And then over time, people are like, we need to rename DevOps. No, it's a metaphor. Uh, Dev and Ops, it's a wall between groups. Like, and I'm a hypocrite on that, but let's save that for later. Jenkins came along to see. And then, um, you know, there are other architects types that are in history, and one of these guys is John Allspar. Um, right, we saw him back in his 10 deploys day at Flickr. And um, I don't know, I, you know, I have to try to keep the dates. 2011, 2010-ish. <coughs> actually, Ben Black, who was actually one of the progenitors of Amazon's web services, little history thing, um, Chris Brown actually created it, but um, he tweeted this interesting paper called Why, How Complex Systems Fail by uh, a doctor, um, an anesthesiologist called Dr. Richard Cook. And at that time, Richard Cook was not involved in IT at all, he was a, who really thought about the complexities of system thinking <coughs> in patient care. And so John wrote this blog article, and you can find John's kitchen soap, it's all there, and he talked about, like, oh my God, like, this is so IT and web operations. Like, he's listing these things about what like, complex systems and how they fail. And then, uh, you know, John later um, included it in a book called Web Operations. Interesting book, the chapter book. Had it come out six months later, it would have been called DevOps-Web Operations. Um, it's got chapters from John, it's Dr. Cook's in it, and, uh, Andrew Schaefer, Patrick, um, uh, Adam Jacob, I said already. Just, oh, Eric Reese. Uh, lean startup. And John continued like this. You, you started seeing John's passion here of this whole other industry of people who thought about um, <coughs> things dying in hospitals and how do you get to the bottom of this? How do you do system staking? Uh, airplane crashes. How do you actually just not sell oh, pilot error done? Right? Um, like, how do you get like a large body of work, right? That I, I can't explain here in like a couple of minutes. Uh, but then he wrote another article about release engineering, and he introduced this guy named Sidney Decker, who is really a student of a whole bunch of people that are really serious about this, including somebody called Dr. Woods. Sorry I'm throwing up a lot of names out there. But Dr. Woods, by the way, was one of the people who was involved in the uh, Columbia post-mortem. Right? Serious stuff. And John was basically telling us, pay attention, folks. This is so relative to large-scale web operations. Act two, this freaking whale shows up. <laughs> God dang it. You've got to screw everything up. But actually, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to run out of time, so i got to go real quick on certain things. And I talked about this before. Uh, late 2012, a couple of people pinged me and said, you know, I know you're an evangelist. I, love, I know you like, you know, bleeding technology. You need to talk to this kid, <laughs> another kid. And I uh, was like, oh, shit, I might need another kid to change my life again, right? Uh, but I did actually talk to this kid, Simon uh, uh, Solomon Hope. Like, oh, God, my brain is fried these days. Um, and this was before anybody really knew about, like, what Docker was. They were actually um, a company called Bot Cloud. And I spoke to him. We had a lot of conversations. And I was like, okay, I, I got to be honest with you. 
I didn't think it was going to be like it, it turned out to be. But I knew it was the next chef for me, in, in mentally. Like, this was another, oh my God, like containers, this is going to be different. Like, it's another layer of, like, getting rid of cruft and all this stuff, right? So I got it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I was at a company that got sold to Dell. I was actually uh, bartering for a uh, first man in at, um, at what was going to be Docker. And, you know, and we, you know, like another presentation I want to talk about, all the mistakes I've made in my life. I mean, we can have fun with that. But I, I dropped out, but it, it was a bird to hand. I made a pretty good money uh, selling a company to Dell. Um, Moving on, this is one that most people don't, haven't heard about. Um, actually, Dave Zwieback, like, there's been three rounds of organizers here, and this is the latest, but uh, Zwieback and gang were part of um, the last generation, and Dave's out now at Facebook, and he's living the dream, he's doing SRE at Facebook, but he's just pretty awesome, I got to visit him recently there. Uh, but he wrote this article for O'Reilly, and said that DevOps is this thing called ICE. You know, and, um, and like the camps thing, I never, we never created that to be like, hey, stop making acronyms. We own the acronym. Like, that wasn't the point, right? And it did stick a little. But one of the things I loved about this is he said that DevOps <coughs> is really uh, inclusivity, complexity, and empathy. And, um, and, and this was around the time, again, I was asked to, uh, it used to be people invite me to do a state of the DevOps, right? And I would just go and give any presentation I wanted. And then, and then the DevOps Chicago folks said, hey, hey, John, we want you to do State of DevOps, but like, I really want you to do State of DevOps this time. Like, oh, shit. All right. And I started, and this was right about time this came out, and I, um, and I thought about, like, okay, what's going on with inclusivity, right? We have DevOps days growing. I mean, this is why I really, I have a better chart than this than Ashton does, but, but for, you know, Ashton did all this. This is, like, awesome for me. Um, and um, the woman over there is doing the graphics. Um, and, uh, but you see there was some hockey sticks between 12 and 13, right? And some of the hockey sticks were the DevOps Days events were happening all over the world. Uh, there was a DevOps survey going on uh, through Public Labs and Gene Kim. Um, and like, you started seeing like we were expanding more people, more cities. Um, the DevOps survey was getting more data about what we're doing, what we're doing right. Um, you know, for me personally, um, this is about the time I met Bridget. And Bridget, you changed my life too, right, for a number of reasons. In fact, there's some real interesting history in this about that upstate in New York, right? So um, in 2000, I think it was probably 14, I, I get a little confused um, on the timelines, but we were, we were starting to organize the next Silicon Valley DevOps days. I was a local organizer at for a couple of years. And we were like, okay, you know what, we suck, we need to get more diversity, we need to get a better plan, we need to get, we need to, um, we need to like, roll up the sleeves, actually uh, Jennifer Davis came in and was, became an organizer, we're like, okay, you know what, like, we're going to be better at this than just doing all male conferences, right, which is, we didn't know any better, you know, I, I can play the I'm 58 game, but, um, and, but I saw, um, I saw Bridges' presentation here in New York, actually in here, I'm pretty sure, and it was an Ignite talk, I'm like, shit, I got somebody, I got somebody, it'll be awesome, and we invited Bridget, and of course she was awesome, and anybody knows Bridget is, knows she is always perpetually and eternally awesome. Um, and, and so that was kind of a thing there where um, we started thinking more about like not running all male agendas. Fortunately, it happens still. Um, the enterprise started getting involved. Um, I started working on networking, got me in all sorts of trouble. That was the networking security. Started to happen, we're talking about the rugged manifesto. Uh, another interesting thing, code of conduct, right? You saw that this morning? No, I you know, I go by my memory until somebody tells me I'm wrong. But I'm pretty certain that Andrew Schaefer is the one that instigated this. You know, from confirmation. It was Pittsburgh, and Andrew wrote the first one and said, you know, hey, this is bullshit. We need to actually have a code of conduct. And that became now it is mandatory on any DevOps days to have a code of conduct. So they go, Andrew Schaefer. Um, so, um, what else happened? Oh, so I was talking about, um, you know, ICE, inclusivity, right? We've done a pretty good job. I mean, complexity is a long-standing thing, and, and we were really starting as an industry, I think, uh, one of the things good at DevOps, like, we're really good at trying to look at other places, and, you know, we had Richard Cook's um, How Complex Systems Fail, um, Mark Burgess had written an amazing book, incredibly hard to read, called Search of Certainty, which, like, Literally, uh, I got a laugh out there. You read it? Yeah, I was 
say, like, if you don't know what the Planck length is, be prepared to open up a gazillion Google pages to read other stuff. But, but it's an incredible book, right? Um, and I didn't know, by the way, what a Planck length was. So, um, and, uh, but he covers complexity, and there's some other places, you know, um, systems thinking, um, you know, other areas. But there was a whole push, um, cybernetics. Um, and then going back to E, to ICE, um, this is one of those ones where you're like, shit, I wish I would wrote that far article. Uh, Jeff Suster wrote an article that, you know, um, empathy is the essence of DevOps. And they're like, oh my god, yes. Like, if we want one word, like, like all right, Ross, gun your head, give me one word. DevOps, it's empathy, right? Um, you know, and, and he nailed it, and, and it really... Um, uh, I mean, really, I mean, we think about everything, and I, I've talked a little bit more about this, but, but um, it's all about empathetic transactions. Back in the early days, DevOps, we talked about embedded engineers, how do you take ops and put them in a dev group. You know, you, you saw a lot of push of blamelessness, uh, retrospectives, blame, blameless retrospectives, right, all that stuff, right? It's all empathetic transactions, right? Um, you know, just again, my lens, I remember reading... Um, Jennifer Davis and Catherine Daniels' effect of DevOps. And I got, this is where I got to be a little honest, I was a little worried they were going to beat me to the market with a book I was working on with Gene. And, and they did. And, so Gene, and I read it, and Gene, you know, Jennifer sent me her copy, and I'm like, okay, you know, is, is the industry ready for two DevOps type of books? Oh my God, you know, is it really that big? And, and I read it, and I remember going back to Gene, like, like, they covered a whole different subject than us. It was, and, and um, at the time, I liked it. You know, like I was saying, I liked it. Um, and then, um, about two years ago, I actually wrote a course, Introduction to Devops from Links Foundation, it's out there, it's free. Um, and I wanted to cover, it was originally going to just be about this DevOps handbook that I've been involved in, talking about. And, but I wanted to cover more. I wanted to cover guys like Suster and Andrew and, and all these things we didn't cover in the handbook. And I went back and I read Effective DevOps, and I realized, no, it's not a good book, it's a fucking great book. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, it's, it's one of the reasons why I think diversity works. Um, you know, because um, it was, their perspective was just different than four freaking guys that, that wrote the DevOps Handbook. Now, I think DevOps Handbook is a really good book. Um, it's my book, so... I, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take that with a great salt. But I love this book, and I covered it in deep. It's like one of those things when you're going to cover it, you're going to really read it. And they just talked about um, just, um, you know, Heroes, and, and it was a really good angle to understand. So I, I think so much read in our industry. I mean, I came to the conclusion at some point that that really, whether you call it ice or not, that there is this uh, umbrella of empathy that uh, it, um, it creates an umbrella of inclusion and complexity. Um, inclusion is listening and learning, like looking for other areas, other people. Um, complexity is really just giving up deterministic thinking, the hubris. I know that system will look like this. Well, but no, no, it will. I mean, <laughs> we, you know, we, we start embracing a notion of that we can understand complex adaptive systems because they change so freaking fast. So it is another form of empathetic or empathy in that we embrace complexity not as just cool words, but we actually start thinking about systems and not in a world where we think we can turn a knob and it shall not look like this in a given moment. We start embracing a whole different notion, which, by the way, is covered very well in Mark's book about probabilities and, and how physics people do that stuff. Um, anyway, moving on. Then I say, this is what I, I was going to do some audio and stuff, but, like, but I was going to do inner sand. But the full screen. You know, G. Kim comes in. Now, he'd been in it a while. He was actually on a panel in the DevOps State in 2010. But I guess the Phoenix Project, it'll be five years in February. You know, how many people read the Phoenix Project? Right, a lot. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a novel. It's a rewrite of an old novel from Elliot Gorat. I mean, it, it, it put a stake in the ground um, in our industry. Um, you know, I, and at the time, I met Gene. This was a 10-year thing that he was working on. And, uh, and I remember, um, I met him about six years in, and he, him, me, and Patrick were talking about, this is a novel, right? So at the end of the novel, we're like, ah, so then what do I do? Hey, screw you. <laughs> so we started talking about, like, creating a prescriptive guide to that novel, and, um, 
and you know, it's one of those like do as we say, not as we do, because it took us five years to write it. Um, but the um, it became a book, and then Jez got involved really early too, and we really tried to create this um, guy with case studies, and there's like 50 case studies. I mean, at least 30 of them are enterprise, ugly enterprise. I mean, not just oh, we did DevOps and everything was glorious. Um, I mean, just a little, um, it's a little over a year old, 100,000 copies sold. Phoenix is, is breaking 400,000 now. Um, I, I did a thing on burnout. I mean, I'll just point you to the blog article. In fact, going back to New York, I had written this article. Some young man committed suicide in the LA DevOps community, and it, it tore me up. It, it took me off the grid, basically. I asked Gene if I could write a blog article on his website, and he did. Um, it kind of escalated into a lot of great discussions. Um, and in fact, the DevOps organizers invited me to do the keynote on it here. The last Dev, I think the last DevOps day is here. Um, another thing um, that was interesting, John Allspar had pointed out this thing called the Ron Westrom model. And the reason this is important, in fact, today John says he wishes he would have never introduced this, so, which is another longer discussion. But um, Ron Westrom is a sociologist that, um, that basically looked at organizational culture, not IT. Um, and um, he looked at organizations in three categories, pathological, bureaucratic, and generative. Um, you know, the, the, just in summary, uh, generative is kind of blameless, faster, um, you know, learning organizations, <coughs> pathological, or blameful. But what happened is, in 2015, that DevOps survey, Jez Humble had got read this, along with Nicole Forsgren, who is actually a PhD statistician, psychometrician. They used this for the survey. So now they didn't just ask questions like, do you use Chef? Do you deploy a billion times a day, right? They actually ask you questions about, do you, who gets in trouble? Fire, oh shit, 10 minutes, all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I you were going to say 20 or 30. Um, one of the things that really happened was interesting, we saw that, um, that uh, this interesting thing that the generative cultures were 200 times faster at, at producing mm -hmm. software than the, uh, the pathological, but what was really satisfying was they were more, more resilient, empty tar and higher. Um, boy, I can't even talk about Ross. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that came up a lot was, can the enterprise do this? I remember uh, watching uh, the first Minnesota Dallas Days screaming, and I saw Ross and Heather, I'm like, gotcha, everybody else, you can do DevOps without compromising into DevOps. And I, that's basically where I met. Um, at Ross. A um, couple more things. I thought I was going to have more time. Ben Rockwood in 2011 had this amazing presentation called Transformation DevOps. And it ultimately um, convinced me that it all started with Deming. Um, I went back and I really tried to learn everything I could about Deming. And he was right in. Like, ben Rockwood is this good looking, handsome, great father, reads like 80 books a week, is smart as shit, and he wears a kilt. I mean, like, what else can you, like, not love about this guy, right? Um, and, and he, he, he got me really thinking about this whole thing, and, um, and, and primarily, I, I can't recommend hire them. Like, skip every other lean book that exists, honestly. You don't need to read them, honestly. I, I wouldn't have said this about a year ago, but read, uh, if you want to learn lean and, and understand how it relates to DevOps, it's Mike Ross, it's Toyota Kata, and then right after that, read uh, Steven Spears' uh, High Velocity Edge. Um, the learning, um, again, Andrew Schaefer comes back, and he uh, introduces... Another landmark presentation at Velocity called, um, basically, uh, There Is No Talent Shortage. And I'll just leave you with this. This was recorded. Um, he talks about learning, and he says that and this is the best quote in DevOps to date. You are either building a learning organization or you will be losing to one. Uh, um, there's things about Kananahan and, and some great stuff. Um, it, it got me thinking about DevOps. I tried to think about how would I present this to an executive I came up in my own mind that DevOps is a set of practices and patterns that turn human capital into organizational. Um, today, I'm really focusing on this DevOps Kaizen, uh, security, DevSecOps. Um, at RSA early last year, I saw a presentation by Etna, and it kind of changed me from thinking about rugged to DevSecOps in that it was about um, filling in all the buckets. And, and again, I, I wish I had more time here. And I've done a bunch of presentations on this. Like, if you think about the original, look at the bottom there, the kind of the original um, kind of CI supply chain. What was, what was the first time, and this is why I 
the slide I want to get about is a systemic or a systems approach where developers take ownership. I've written these presentations, you build it, you secure it, um, where the developers take full ownership of security, and in the end, a bug is a bug is a bug is a bug, right? And so you start creating the same gates that you create, and, and you have to cover all the buckets. You can't just shim in behavior and vulnerability scanning. I mean, you literally, if you want to shift left, like you do with software, security is software. You have to have all those buckets in there. And again, you can find this stuff. Um, can't bands. Um, I do want to talk about this. So what I was in a cybersecurity thing um, about three or four months ago, and they had this um, hacker. He's in another room. They, they disguise his face and all. And he's basically making fun of us. And he said that, you know, he gets paid big money to go into banks and hack these banks. Right? And like and like and he would go to reconnaissance and, and he was basically saying, you know, you're all a bunch of stupid idiots, right? And he said that four of the last five breaches, he basically tailgate to get in. Right? Because somebody held the door open. And I was he was doing the morning keynote, I was doing the evening keynote, and I actually changed my presentation because I thought about like we talk about culture, we talk about behavior, and if you look at the cyber world, the cybersecurity, like we spend like ridiculous amount of money on perimeter and all this stuff. And we talk about culture, but we get disconnected. And I, I started thinking about the felonious, you know, something from a Bill Bryson book, like this, this idea of the, the felonious, divine and felonious nature of things, right? And Bill Bryson has in this book he wrote uh, where he says that there was at a time when the last couple of dodo birds on the planet were being shot by just a couple of sailors that were just for no reason other than for fun. They were putting into extinction the last couple of dodo birds. Literally at that same time, Isaac Newton was, was finishing Precopia, right? Which was changing everything about what he thought about the world. And he said in here, he said, I, I would submit to you to find a better pairing of occurrences to illustrate the divine and formless nature of a human being as an origin. Basically, he was saying, like, my God. And I think about, like, um, well, what do you do for culture? You've got a billion dollars. Because one of the things that, that, um, that hacker didn't understand was he had never worked in a large corporation for 5, 10, 15 years. Because what happens when, you know, Tom or somebody's coming in after me and, and like, he's two paces away and I let the door slam? Now, Tom wouldn't do this. But, uh, but he's like, you asshole, John, you know who I am. And so over the years, you get so, Diane Vaughn calls this the normalization of DV. It's like you just get to a point where, like, you know what, I'm tired of getting yelled at. I know every year there's the poster that we're not supposed to do this. But what do you do? You hold the door open. And so I thought about, I added this in my presentation. Um, here is, it's February. It's raining. Actually, it's Atlanta. It's horrible. And it's a um, snowstorm. And Susie is pregnant with a bunch of boxes in her hand. And she's two paces behind you. And you let the door slam. Right? And you're like, okay. But you wait. Because you're a gentleman and you're, you're, you're a good person, right? And Juicy comes through, badges in, and you're waiting and she says, John, I want to so thank you. Because you just, you remember this, this hacker told, I didn't tell you, the hacker said four out of five breaches, like, we got, got in through tailgate. <clears throat> comes in, puts a Raspberry Pi on her un, uh, an empty um, cube, and it's got you. I'm like, we spent a billion dollars, or we get to a culture where in this situation, the person says, I want to thank you because you made us stronger. You've, uh, you've guarded us against our adversaries. Right? Um, I, I said that John is an archetype. Um, if you look at DevOps Enterprise Summit, what he's doing now at Snapboot, he's taken through his thesis, he's totally embraced us in resilience and safety. Um, some future things, if you haven't seen Simon Wardley's mapping, it's cool stuff. It, it fits a, a, a specific domain. Uh, Adrian Cockrell um, over at um, Amazon is using it for strategic. Um, uh, James Urquhart, you may or may not know, is also using it for strategic. There are some really prominent people using this stuff. Um, if you know anything about Kinevin, it fits into the complicated domain. Um, and then I'll just end with um, something that I've been pretty passionate about. I'm calling it my atom smashing project. And uh, so we, we've learned a lot from Lean. And John has introduced a lot of heavy hitters in um, resilient human factors. One of the things I found out over the last couple of years is they don't really kind of like each other. Uh, John would disagree. They definitely don't talk to each other and they don't collaborate. 
And so I went to Jeannie and I'm like, I want to kind of atom smash this because there's so much commonality between resilience and faith and stuff that Rother talks about in Stephen Spears. So at DevOps Enterprise Summit, we invited um, uh, Cindy Decker, um, Stephen Spears, who are both, um, uh, well, Decker and Cook, or Dr. Cook, as resilience people, and Stephen Spears as uh, lean. We did a four-hour videotape thing, and for the first three hours, they were actually rude, mean. It was, it was incredible. Uh, by the last hour, it was like a glorious agreement, and what you will see publicly now, we're going to actually introduce a lot of the video later, uh, is a panel that's online where they're like, like hugging each other and kissing. And, and, and I want to do this more with the academia specifically. Where we, so me and Gene have been working on a project. Um, it's an audio-only book called Beyond the Phoenix Project that's going to be out um, basically in February uh, where we're going to cover that. We're covering a whole bunch of stuff. It's five years after Phoenix Project. All right, so, and, you know, so that's me and Gene. So one last thing I will say is diversity is hard for us old white guys. Um, I thought I was good. I mean, I thought I was good. I mean, you notice there's all male. Um, and, like, I didn't think about, like, when um, people asked me to do panels and stuff. And last year was a tough year for me. Because I got, I got beat up really bad. And I thought I was, I mean, I'm not sexist. I'm not, like, I'm, I get diversity, but I still sucked at it. And I didn't even know that. And, um, and I was on a couple of all-male panels, and I got called out. And one, I got real defensive and like, had a nervous breakdown, to be honest with you. Um, but the truth is, um, I made a pledge. I'm not going to go to any conference that's all-male. We don't speak all-male. I will not speak on any freaking panel that's all-male. And the last three panels I've been asked to be, I've either <coughs> rejected it, and it's the right thing to do. You know, and if you don't understand that, then go talk to somebody else. But, um, but, but it, it, you know, it, it, you had to come through this horrific tunnel for me to realize I wasn't really as good as I thought I was. Um, but um, it did, again, change me. And I think as, as males, it, it's so easy to go, oh, I'm going to get a panel. That's awesome. You gotta, I'm done. Um, you, you gotta. <laughs> hey, I did it, right? Hey, thank you. <laughs>